Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really glad to participate to this uh, webinar. Um, and so um, it's to present our work on the type one interferon response in uh, the COVID-19 patients and also to try to explain uh, more precisely the inflammatory response that was largely called as the cytokine storm or cytokine hyperinflammation. And so um, um, just as a brief reminder you, you, and why we started to do this work and about the design, uh, you know that the first SARS-CoV-2 um, cases were described at the end of 2019. And uh, from the initial description of the disease, uh, even if the majority of patients were experiencing uh, very mild to moderate disease, um, initially five to 10% were described to progress to a fever disease that could be, that could be really critical uh, and life-threatening uh, manifestations. And uh, if we take the first um, description, especially in mainland China, 6.1% of the cases were, uh, ad, uh, of patients were admitted to the ICU um, because of the disease. And what was really interesting um, since the beginning was this two-step progression disease that was described. Uh, and it was in this uh, publication in the Lancet Journal uh, showing that uh, roughly around nine to 10 days after the first symptoms, there was the worsening of the disease, suggesting that uh, something was happening about the inflammatory response. So um, we, uh, because, so as you said, I work in Koshan Hospital, which, which is clearly working with uh, some um, other uh, research centers like the uh, Imagine Institute, which usually work on uh, genetic disease and also with the Pasteur Institute, uh, we started to um, a collaboration to test the hypothesis that uh, this worsening of the disease around the nine and 10 was a virally driven hyperinflammation uh, leading to the disease, to the severe disease. And so we combined some clinical and biological data, some mice, uh, mass cytometry phenotypical analysis, some wall blood transcriptomic analysis, which is quite important regarding some other works, which some, sometimes were analyzing the PBMCs, sometimes uh, some specific cell types. So it was really a wall blood transcriptomic analysis and also a cytokine measurement. And to be really honest, our initial um, hypothesis was that there was an increased production of interferon uh, that was uh, driving the worsening of the disease, mainly because some of our collaborators were working on um, the sting-related mutations, which are associated with uh, a dramatic uh, increased production of interferon. And so initially, we were thinking that uh, the disease could be driven by a too strong interferon response uh, in response to the, vi to the virus. So we included 50 COVID-19 patients that were um, distinguished between uh, the mild to moderate patients. So all of the patients were hospitalized. And so some of them were um, requiring oxygen uh, lower than three liters per minute or no oxygen. So it was the mild to moderate patients. So severe patients patients were requiring more than three liters per minute of oxygen, but without requiring the transfer to ICU. And the critical patients were requiring the intensive care uh, unit with mechanical ventilation. So we analyzed uh, these uh, 50 patients and um, analyzed them in comparison with uh, 18 LC controls that were negative for the screening of the virus and which were um, uh, um, um, matched for the age and the gender. And what was really important in our work, because as you probably see, the timing of the analysis is really critical if you analyze this very dynamic infection, it was that our time of analysis was after a median duration of 10 days after the first symptoms, which was really the timing associated with the worsening of the disease.
So as you can see on this slide, you have the four groups of patients and um, to support the hyperinflammation, uh, the C-reactive protein was uh, really increased in the severe and critical patients. The lactate deshydrogenase was increased to more severe you were. And as you can see on the panel D, um, the severe and critical patients had more frequently um, done some uh, uh, extended infection uh, on the CD scan. And so first we analyzed the peripheral blood leukocyte phenotyping uh, by using mass cytometry and to try to, to represent the wall uh, markers uh, and the dis 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 distinction of the different population because we use so the mass cytometry with the, uh, the um, uh, panel um, including 30 surface markers. Uh, allowing the, distinguish, the, dis, the distinction of the population. And as you can see, uh, between the different groups, there was a decrease in the density of NK cells and CD3 uh, plus T cells, uh, more pronounced for the CD8, uh, which was driving the lymphopenia that was described since the beginning of the disease. And we were also uh, observing an increase of the B cells, the plasma blast, and the monocytes, uh, and this uh, phenotypes was more prominent, uh, more the disease was severe. Because uh, there was uh, clearly some um, modification of the innate immune system, the adaptive immune system with a lot of inflammation, we used the nanostring um, and counter immunology panel to be able to um, better describe uh, what was underlying this inflammation. So it was not a bulk transcriptomic analysis. It was uh, really uh, focused on a set of uh, roughly 600 genes involved in, in the immunology response. Uh, but what is the advantage of the nanostring? It's to be much more uh, accurate in the quantification of um, the uh, replication and the um, uh, quantification of the mRNAs, uh, much more that the bulk, with the bulk transcriptomic analysis. And as you can see on the lower panel, we were able to identify some genes that were differentially expressed between each status of the disease, the LC controls compared to the mild to moderate, the mild to moderate compared to the severe, and the severe compared to the critical, even if the, the difference between the two more severe group was not so obvious uh, and was much more comparable um, uh, between the two, uh, these two subgroups. And so when we analyzed um, based on an unsupervised um, for, um, PCA, as you can see, two dimensions were mainly driving the difference between groups. The PC1 uh, was mainly made of, TLRs, of genes involved in the TLR signaling in the innate immune system, and I will talk about that just after. And for the PC2, which was quite interesting because it was different, so some genes were really upregulated in the moderate or mild to moderate patients, but after that, in the severe and critical genes, the um, uh, expression of the genes was going down. And it was really interesting to see that it was mainly the genes involved in the type 1 and the type 2 infer interference signaling. So then we analyze more pre accurately uh, the um, interferon pathway. And as you can see on this heat map, some of the genes were going, uh, were upregulated more severe the disease was, and some of the genes in the lower genes were going up in the mild to moderate patients and were then decreasing. And um, it was interesting to see that the genes that were going up was mainly genes involved in the interferon signaling that like the, in the receptor of the interferon uh, alpha. Uh, and in contrast, there was a down regulation of genes which were included in what we call the ISGs, the interference stimulated genes, um, and in critical patients, suggesting that there was a, a, a down regulation or a decrease of the effect of the interferon uh, type 1 um, in terms of transcription.
And so we analyze by different way um, the um, production and the interferon response by analyzing what we call the interferon stimulated genes score, which in fact is a validated score um, defining a type one interferon signature. So it's the top panel on the left. And as you can see, it was increasing after the in, in infected patients in mild to moderate, but it was uh, down, uh, decreasing uh, more the severe the disease was. And so we combine this gene uh, expression analysis to the protein analysis by measuring using SIMOA uh, ELISA as uh, interferon alpha 2. Uh, and as you can see, there was a clear correlation between the ISG and the protein, uh, the interferon protein. And we observed the same thing. So it means that more severe the patients were, uh, lower the interferon alpha, uh, the protein, was going down. We also analyzed a more functional assay, which is a type 1 interferon activity, which is in fact the ability of the serum of the patients to rescue uh, viral cells uh, from uh, the infection by the virus. And as you can see, um, it was also going down and using digital PCR, uh, to measure uh, much more accurately that the conventional PCR, the amount of virus in the blood, we observed that, uh, in contrast, more severe the patients were, more uh, uh, higher was the detection of the viral RNA, which was not a proof uh, of the link between that, but possibly a consequence, this increased replication of the virus, uh, um, a consequence of the impaired interferon alpha production. We also observed that there was no detectable, no detectable uh, interferon beta uh, based on the cytokine measurement or in terms of genes. And so it suggested that the patients with severe and critical COVID-19 had an impaired type 1 interferon production and probably as the consequence, but not uh, as a proof with the data we had, um, probably the consequence um, uh, and responsible for a lower viral clearance. We try to evaluate if this impaired interferon uh, type 1 uh, antiviral response could be predictive of the evolution uh, in terms of clinical evolution. And as you can see, if we compare the patients that were mild to moderate or severe uh, with a stable a disease or an improvement or patients we had worsening of the disease, um, so I mean uh, in requiring the admission to the ICU. Uh, patients, we had a, 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 a poor outcome, as you can see in red, uh, had a lower ISG score and lower interferon alpha production, suggesting that this impaired type 1 interferon activity uh, seemed to precede the clinical deterioration uh, to uh, the admission to the ICU. And even if it was with really low number of patients, we saw that maybe there was some different kinetic between the groups. As you can see in mild to moderate patients, there was an increased production of interferon alpha-2 that seems to be quite uh, uh, maintained um, over, uh, over the time. In severe patients, uh, it seems to be uh, an increased production initially, but was not sustained during the infection. And in contrast, in critical patients, uh, the interferon alpha production seems to be low uh, during the whole um, uh, uh, time uh, of the infection. Next, uh, based on that uh, impaired type 1 interferon production, uh, we try to dissect the, the mechanism of it is in fair in fair in uh, hyperinflammation that you know now um, uh, leads to the um, initiation of dexamethasone based on the uh, recovery uh, trial in UK and uh, also um, um, probably led to the use of tocilizumab in some patients. So we analyze between groups uh, the genes involved in the cytokines and the chemokine related genes. And as you can see, there was a clear increase expression as function of the disease severity. And it was also 
um, um, uh, including the genes involved in the innate immune system or also in the cytokine production or chemokine signaling. And so we first focused on IL-6 because it was really identified really early as a major uh, protein. And what was interesting is that even if we were um, um, detecting very high levels of interleukin-6 interleukin in the serum of the patient, as you can see on the low panel on the left, uh, we were not able to detect any uh, IL-6 RNA in the blood, suggesting that it could be produced uh, in the site of infection, it means the lung, but in contrast, the interferon uh, IL-6 induced genes like SOC3, STAT3, were significantly increased, reflecting that there was a huge activation of the interleukin-6 signaling pathway, but that the origin of the interleukin-6 production was probably not from the whole blood, but more probably from the inflamed tissues, especially the lungs. We also analyzed the TNF alpha, and we observed quite the same thing. So it means that there was a significant increase of the TNF in terms of proteins in the serum, but it was not the case at the transcriptional level. So, and we observed that the TNF pathway related genes were completely upregulated, more severe the disease was. And so, as I told you, this discrepancy between the RNA uh, levels and the protein measurement was probably suggesting that um, uh, the lung was uh, the site of production and not the blood. So we next explored uh, the transcriptional factors that may drive these exacerbated inflammations. And as you can see in this heat map, which is enriched in genes um, belonging to the nf kappa -B pathway, that there was a huge activation and upregulation of the genes involved in the nf uh, kappa -B pathway. And so, um, even if we were not able to analyze that, except for the measurement of some um, uh, proteins involved in necroptosis, for instance, or pyroptosis, uh, and so to the cellular damage, that these aberrant nf kappa -A activations could probably be the consequence of an excessive immune, innate immune sensor activations, either by a pathogen associated molecular patterns, but also more probably to the increased uh, damage associated molecular patterns released in fact by the necrotic cells by the protein. And I don't know if you saw this recent paper in cell showing that there was an increase of the calprotectin uh, in the serum of severe patient, which is really an alarming um, um, associated with the damage. And also a, a science paper re recently published also show an increase, for instance, in NRAGE, uh, which is also an alarming that, that was dramatically increased in severe patients. So overall, our data were suggesting that Probably in mild to moderate COVID-19, there is an efficient type 1 interferon production and, and activity leading to the viral clearance and probably a well-balanced um, inflammation and production between pro- and anti-inflammatory cytokines leading to the resolution of the disease. And that probably in uh, severe to critical patients, this impaired type 1 production uh, and activity uh, probably related to either the virus by itself or the host factors were related, associated to viral persistence and probably to uh, the presence of um, uh, this exaggerated inflammation through the presence of pathogen associated molecular patterns, but also probably some damage associated molecular patterns. All of these uh, stimuli being able to drive the nf kappa -B pathway uh, for which we found that TNF, alpha, and IL-6 seem to be uh, the more prominent cytokines. And just to support and to um, just present some data from the literature, you probably saw this work from uh, Benjamin Tenoever um, uh, in cell uh, models and animal models, especially the furates, showing that 
uh, the SARS-CoV-2 infection in comparison with the flu infection, for instance, was defined by low levels of type 1 and type 3 interferon associated with the chemokines and the expre eye expression of FIL6. So this work that was published in Cell was really complementary because it was really showing some in vitro and animal models with tissue analysis that was really interesting for that. And um, just yesterday in science, you probably saw this work from the Stanford group of Pali uh, Punandran showing by a side seek analysis and two cohorts that uh, there was a reduced expression of HLA-DR in myelid cells and especially an impaired mTOR signaling in plasmacidoic dendritic cells. And we know that mTOR is driving the production of interferon alpha in this in the this in PDC. And so they also observe a decreased production of interferon alpha um, in um, in the PDC. And they also observed in two cohorts at the single cell transcriptomic levels that there was no type 1 interferon in severe patient was really complementary and consistent with the importance of the of this impaired interferon pathway. And just to finish, you probably saw also to try to understand why this patient could have um, some impaired type 1 interferon response. This paper in the JAMA uh, showing that in four men from two unrelated disease uh, families, so young men with no comorbidities, that they uh, demonstrated some loss of function variants of the theater 7 and so that in these patients we had severe and some uh, and one of them uh, we died from that a downstream type 1 interferon signaling as um, suggested by the decrease of the isg um, uh, in these patients and just because also i think it's not far from colombia um, uh, this uh, very nice uh, review in immunity by the colleagues from the Mount Sinai uh, that made a review really quickly after the beginning of the pandemic showing that the MERS and the SARS-CoV-1 also uh, showed very different um, uh, function able to, to, to decrease the type 1 interferon and so it's highly probable and there is some more and more study uh, supporting that, that some of the proteins from the virus are able to decrease and impair the type 1 interferon response. So just I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, of course, all the patients that participated and their families, the collaborators, and just uh, also Alan Fisher, which was uh, 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 very um, 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 nice um, uh, immunologists working on uh, pediatric and genetic disease and we helped us to uh, really well um, analyze the data and so I would like to acknowledge him uh, again. Thank you for your attention. All right, Benjamin, thank you very much for that beautiful story. Yeah, that, this is a really uh, important area, for sure, in, um, you know, we're seeing again and again this discord, this disconnect between, you know, the interferon system signaling and and the impaired ISG, and uh, you know, so you're getting this massive inflammatory response without the antiviral effect that you would normally want. Um, and I think it's it's going to be it's going to make the treatment very uh, difficult in the sense that you're you're treading a fine line of uh, wanting to activate it in one way and not activate it in another way. All right, we, let me see. Yes, we have some questions from the audience. Um, so one question from Rod Rothstein is, do we understand now maybe why trying to clear IL-6 from the blood uh, is failing to diminish the cytokine storm? Yeah, um, it's quite an important question. And uh, that's true that so far, there is really conflicting results about that because um, um, as you said, the Saridumab study was negative. 
the Roche study uh, with tocilizumab was negative. There was a study in France using tocilizumab, uh, which is right now under revision in uh, one of the big journal, um, suggesting that it was providing a benefit uh, compared to the standard of care. Uh, but clearly the question of the potential, even if it's still debated, of the efficacy between tocilizumab and sarilumab, both of them targeting the same IL-6 receptors, is really complicated to analyze. We know that maybe the, the specificity of the antibody is not the same between the two drugs, and so the ability to bind uh, the, the IL-6 receptors, and also uh, some of our colleagues found that there was really huge levels of soluble IL-6 receptors in the serum of the severe patients. So is the treatment not able to be quite effective because uh, there is so much soluble IL-6 receptors? I don't know. Is there a discrepancy between the two drugs because the the affinity of the two antibodies for the receptor is not the same. Um, I think there is quite some question about the dose and probably the question of the, of the soluble forms of the interleukin-6 receptor that could counteract with the efficacy of the drugs. Uh, but it's a very big question and I think, I hope we will have some response. And so that's why we also think and we proposed a study for that in France to evaluation the combination of interferon alpha combined with TNF alpha blockers because in the NF kappa B cascade, uh, the TNF is much more upstream than the L6, and um, the L6 is one of the markers that is increased when the NF kappa B pathway is deactivated. But we want to be the more most upstream uh, as possible. But there is still some question, and I agree that it's not really clear why the L6 is not much more effective in this disease. But I think also what all the study is so far is to consider that the cytokine storm was only an inflammatory disease. And even if it's probably the inflammatory side which is re uh, associated with the death, I think we have to not forget that it's viral infections and not considering a combination to treat both the virus and the damage induced by the virus. I think it's probably, um, it's probably, um, it could be explained some, some stuff. So, yeah. mm. so it sounds like, I mean, one thing could be TNF alpha is more important and that's not being dealt with adequately by only focusing on IL-6. And then it's also that you need to do two things. You need to stop the virus and you need to stop yeah. inflammation. Yeah. And, and those are often at odds with each other, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. So uh, I hope that there will be some trials in patients combining approach against the virus and against the inflammation because so far I, also, I think there is only data evaluating only one of the aspect and of both aspect in combination. Right. I think the other interesting thing is your point that the tissue issue is important. That if you're only looking in blood and all the all this all the cytokines are coming from the lung, you're not seeing the whole picture. So yeah, you, yeah. And so uh, really, there was some interesting data from uh, autopsic uh, and in the study, for instance, from Teno ever uh, uh, initially in the in the in the animal models, they were able also to analyze from autopsy lungs. And so uh, that find that there was no interferon at all in the, in the infected lungs either. But also sometimes when the patients died and we're, when we are able to get some tissue, we are probably late in the infection. And when we see the dynamic of the infection and the interferon production, it's really tricky to see if the difference we see are related to the timing or to um, the status associated with the disease.